Let's go ahead and call this meeting of Senate Appropriations Committee to order. We're hearing Senate Bill 349. If you have some preliminary matters, let's see. Rudy Keller with the Tribune asked to take photographs, which normally we don't allow unless there's permission given. Uh, that's okay. Progress, Missouri, Laura Swinford. Where's Laura Swinford? Okay. What's Progress, Missouri? Huh? What's Progress, Missouri? Uh, we do communications work. Okay. So you want to videotape it? I do. Okay. That's all right. That would be great. I appreciate it. And then, uh, do we have another one? Or we have one more. Early farmer market. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, that's fine. Just so the doormen know, otherwise they tend to get a little tight about this one. Let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and call this uh, hearing to order and have a uh, presentation of Senate Bill 349. Senator LaVoe. <coughs> Good afternoon, Senator. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, committee. Thank you very much for um, this uh, hearing on Senate Bill 349. I'm Paul Lavoda, representing the 11th District. I'm here today to talk about Senate Bill 349, which I do see as the most important issue that we face in the General Assembly, uh, perhaps the most important issue that we'll be facing in our career here. I've been fighting for this since 2005 and will continue to keep fighting. I do this because our state's favorite son, Harry S. Truman, would have done the same. As I represent Harry's home, Harry's hometown, I feel incumbent to do this well. On November 19, 1945, President Truman sent a presidential message to Congress proposing a new national health care program. In his message, Truman argued that the federal government should play a role in health care, saying the health of American children, like their education, should be recognized as a definite public responsibility. Opponents called Truman's plan socialized medicine. The proposal was shelved at the outbreak of the Korean War, but the main idea behind Truman's health care push that the federal government should play a role in health care for those who cannot afford it lives on. In 1965, when President Lyndon B. Johnson signed Medicaid bill, or Johnson Care, in the law at the Harry S. Truman Library Museum in the 11th Senatorial District, he said, all started with the man from independence. We need to carry Truman's vision forward to the present day. I'm not saying this because I'm a Democrat from independence. A lot of people on all sides of the political spectrum are on this. The Missouri Chamber of Commerce supports the Medicaid expansion, not because they're big supporters of this president and his agenda, but because it's a smart thing to do. They know that brings billions of dollars back to Missouri is good for our state's economy. The chambers in Kansas City, St. Louis, Independence, Lee Summit, and Springfield are right there with them. The Associated Industries of Missouri also back the expansion. For these business leaders, this is not a political decision. It's an economic one. The good news is that Medicaid expansion will pay for itself. First of all, the federal government will pay the entire cost of expansion for the first three years. If Missouri does not expand Medicaid, tax dollars Missourians pay will simply be spent on health care services in other states. We won't get a refund. We just have to be paying the bills for states to do their Medicaid. But even over the long run, there's a net positive fiscal impact. According to the University of Missouri study, the federal government will contribute $8.2 billion to Missouri's Medicaid expansion between 2014 and 2020. That's 96.1% of the cost of expansion. During that same period, the state will contribute $332.9 million in expanding Medicaid just 3.9% of the total cost. The study's authors include, conclude that the Medicaid expansion will generate $856 million in state and local taxes in the period. That's a net gain of $523 million. And remember, even when the expansion is fully phased in after 2020, Missouri will never be paying more than 10%. That's 10 people insured for the cost of one. That's a good idea. My bill includes a trigger that would undo the expansion in case the federal government fails to uphold its end of the bargain. Medicaid expansion could be the single largest job creation in Missouri, far outpacing legislative incentives such as the Quality Jobs Program or any 
tax credit programs designed to entice employers to hire more people and relocate to our state. Expanding Medicaid will create more than 24,000 new jobs in Missouri in 2014. In just one year, that is more than the employment of Missouri's 10 Fortune 500 companies. Those new workers would be earning nearly $1 billion per year and would generate more than $1.3 billion in gross state product. Most of those will be working in high-paying, skilled medical jobs, the kind of jobs that bring a bright future to young Missourians. And it's not just me saying that. You'll hear the testimony of business leaders who say the same thing. The 300,000 people who will become eligible under the expansion are working Missourians whose income is simply not high enough to cover the cost of health care. People with decent middle class jobs, like truck drivers, factory workers, restaurant servers, have been left out in the cold as the cost of health care has risen. Current Medicaid eligibility rates disqualify adults earning 19% or more of the federal poverty level. Meaning, a family of four that earns just $5,000 a year would be considered too wealthy for their parents to qualify for Medicaid. But if this bill passes, the same family would be able to earn up to $32,000 a year without losing coverage. If this segment of the population can access our health care system, everyone wins. Right now, people without health coverage are forced to rely on emergency rooms when they get sick. This causes a serious financial burden to hospitals, and those costs are passed on to the insured in the form of higher premiums. The University of Missouri estimates that if Medicaid is expanded, Missourians will save $119 million in premium costs in 2014 alone. If Missouri refuses to expand Medicaid, hospitals in rural Missouri could close, leaving thousands of Missourians without access to care. With Without nearby regular access to health care, the quality of life that people enjoyed in rural Missouri will quickly, quickly decline. In 2011, Missouri hospitals provided $1.1 billion in uncompensated care, much of it in the form of emergency room visits. Currently, the federal government reimburses hospitals providing this care, but those payments will begin to decrease under the Affordable Health Care Act. The Missouri Hospital Association estimates Missouri stands to lose 704 million in federal reimbursements to hospitals. Without Medicaid expansion, the loss of federal funds will make it difficult for many small rural hospitals to remain open. The Missouri Hospital Association estimates that close to 10,000 hospital jobs will be lost between now and 2021 if expansion doesn't pass. All right, sir, let me stop you. First of all, I applaud your effort, and I agree with you in your discussion about expansion of health care options, wise health care options to a larger portion of the population. We agree there. I think, obviously, we all know, and this issue has gotten pretty far down the road now in this process, so you're presenting the bill now, but I think most everyone on the committee is aware of what the issues are. And the, the true question is, is this the correct mechanism? Is this something, I mean, this issue that has faced this country and every state for quite a long time, is this the right fix? Is this the way to do it? And I think that that's the issue that we're weighing all right, so in, in, in your uh, testimony, you said it will add approximately 300,000? Yes. And I know the governor's used that number. I've seen some numbers from the private insurance industry that put that number at 400,000. Uh, how many people are currently on Medicaid in the state of Missouri? Um, if I have that number here. I'll tell you, it's 900,000. 900,000. Yeah. Now, does your bill in any way affect those 900,000 that are currently on Medicaid? They would, they would continue to be covered. Right, it doesn't change that. And for those 900000 for every dollar that we spend on them, it is roughly a 60-40 match. So in other words, for every dollar we spend on that existing population of 900000 the state pays $0.40 cents on that dollar, and the federal government reimburses $0.60 cents on that dollar. And of that amount that comes from general revenue right now, to pay our share of that is just over $3 billion. And so your bill, essentially what it would do is the federal government would pay... You have to take the existing 900000 out because they don't change. They stay the same. All their stuff stays the same. What your bill does is it adds between three and 400000 new recipients on top of the existing population, correct? That's correct. Okay. And the way the Affordable Care Act is drafted, for the first three years of implementation, the federal government would pay 100% of that population. Again, not, not impacting the existing population, just that population, correct? Yes. Okay. And then after that, up until 2020, roughly, it ratchets down to where the state pays 10%. That's right. Okay. Do you know that, I mean, what, what's the dollar amount that the federal government's going to spend between 2014 and 2016 to pay for that additional Missouri population? 
between 2014 and 2016? Yeah. I can tell you what it is. Okay. Oh, it's five billion dollars. That's how much the federal government will pay. That's what the feds are going to pay for those first three years to expand Missouri. It's five billion dollars. Do you know the federal government currently borrows <coughs> forty cents on every dollar that it spends? It borrows. Mm -hmm. So that's an additional five billion dollars that they're going to. Well, that it, spend but that's not that's not an additional five billion dollars. Five billion dollars that has been paid for in the in the Affordable Health Care Act through higher taxes, through and, and by the providers as well. So we're not asking the federal government to add that money to the federal deficit. This is money that's already already there. It's already there. We can have that argument, but it's five billion dollars. <coughs> Where it comes from, I think, is a pretty open, wide open debate. Well, and I do well, know the rationale. The rationale, you know, if you could say anything that the federal government does. Adds to the federal government, which has wars, everything else. So, this is this is not going to be a, a if we don't pass this a five billion dollar payment to our international debt. It's just not going to and you do raise a good point about basically other people's premiums paying for the expansion. I do know that in discussions I've had, for example, with Blue Cross Blue Shield in January 14, they anticipate everyone's premiums going up between 100 and 160 percent, and that's in part to pay for part of this. So you are correct. That is in part how part of it is paid for. Well, I, and I, I think we have seen increases in insurance for the last decade, if not longer. And you know, just saying that the Affordable Health Care Act is adding to that doesn't really quite make sense because they've been going up anyway. I mean, and, and the reason they've been going up is this uncompensated care. That's what this is trying to do. Okay, and let's say that we were to actually stick at 10%, at least from 2017 to 2021, do you know how much that will cost the state from general revenue? Well, every time I keep looking for my sheet here, I... It's $800 million. Okay. And that's just to 2021. 20, so, okay. And and, and, can you say this again? I'm sorry. Yeah, it's $800 million. $800 million that, would, that the state would pay in its, in its part. Uh, yeah, our, our share starting in 2017 where it starts to ratchet to 90 10 because it doesn't do it right away. But in that process from 2017 to 2021, uh, that's, it's actually $805 million. And so... I won't go into my whole discussion here, but for example, for next year's budget of $7.5 billion in discretionary general revenue, a little over $3 billion of that goes to our current obligations on Medicaid. $3 billion goes to public education, both K-12 through and higher ed, almost all of that K-12. through And about $740 million goes to prisons, and there's not much left. So are you willing, when we have to pay $800 million out of general revenue, for that to come from public education? Because I am not. And well, I just, I don't know that that's going to happen, but I see that scenario playing out very clearly. Well, I'm just asking you your opinion. Yeah, I, I'd be glad to tell you, Ben. We, we, have a, uh, um, we have a tax revenue bill that we hit this week that hits us about $800 million. We have other ideas that um, tax credits are costing us money. But never does the question come up, are you willing to cut education on that? It only happens when we're talking about Medicaid. The truth of the matter is, we'll grow as a state, and this will help us do that. And, you know, I, Mr. Chairman, your, your numbers may be exactly correct, but as we grow as a state, we have a constitutional obligation to make sure we're paying for schools. Schools are not, are not the scapegoat on why we should be doing this. We, we can actually get this done, have the economic effects of it, have the money from the federal government, and actually do both. Questions from the committee? <coughs> Senator Girls. Thank you. Um, Senator, thank you for being here today. And you know this health care issue is something that I hold um, um, very near to me. Um, <clears throat> thank you. I, I, I know we have difficult decisions here to make, of course, in this committee. Um, you know, I'm in full support of expansion. I recognize the importance of it. Um, I think all of us do, or at least many of us do, I'm sure, in this committee. Um, I guess my question, and it's Maybe my question is more towards the chair um, instead of then to you. At the point where we would then have to pay $800 million, I would suspect we would be left with a decision as to whether to continue the program or not. Is that correct? Yeah, there's really two issues there. I mean, one is, is the governor said you take the free money for three years, which is not free, by the way, and it is going to contribute to the national debt, which is currently 105% gross domestic product, which is, that's a whole other discussion. But the question is, do you take that for three years, as the governor proposed, and then evaluate? I think the reality, do you take 400, between three and 400,000 people who you put on this program and three years later kick them off? 
I don't think that's a reality. So I mean, I think the discussion now is, is this the right mechanism, and is that what we do? Because I think, I think trying to hinge that on, well, we could always remove the program in three years, I don't think that's a legitimate economic or political discussion, even though I know it's been floated out. Well, I, <coughs> maybe it happens to be marketing. I will say that if I were a person that were without insurance, I certainly would rather have insurance for the next three years than to know that I did not have it at all. So if that happens to be a discussion that we need to have concerning this, that we would then give health care for three years for those folks that qualify, then maybe that's a discussion we need to have instead of not having the discussion um, at all. So I don't know if it has to be marketing, whether part of it has to be with expectations of folks being able to remain on it when they can't maintain it. But if that happens to be the case, certainly I would rather, if I were a person without insurance, be giving the benefit of insurance, even if it happened to be for the next three years, than to not have it at all. And I think, the, you know, Senator, in response, I mean, the question is not only the first three years, but in 2021, when we're fully implemented and paying 10% of the cost, uh, as the Senator sponsoring this said, you know, do we, do we change it uh, then? And obviously that's something that, uh, you know, that's an issue as well. But keep in mind, the reason this is a, a big issue for Missouri is expansion for us is different than several other states that are already close to 138% of the poverty level anyway. And some of those states, for example, Illinois and others, are close to a 50-50 match already. So let's say that we hit 2021, and we suddenly, you have all the states in parity at roughly 138% of poverty, and Missouri is only paying 10% of the cost on that, yet other states are paying 50% of the cost. I do not suspect that that will stay at 10% for very long. And if that equalizes even at 40, 60, uh, which is a possibility, you know, that's, it, that's over a billion dollars in a very quick time. So. Well, you know, my bill has a trigger in there. It says that the federal government doesn't live up to their end of the bargain. Then, uh, and we can't follow through with that commitment. It's, it's on that. Right. Okay. I think that's an important part of it. Thank you. Thanks, Senator. Chair. Senator Shaw. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> did I hear you say that it is expected that all of the taxes to pay for the expansion are enough to pay for it? Uh, yes. That's your belief? Yes. Then why is it that they would only cover it for three years? If they're getting not enough money, why why don't they just keep paying for it? Do you know? Well, um, I, I think it's just basically, and you would know more about this, the center, just the design of the program to make sure that the states are contributing as Medicaid is now. Okay, and no. as, the, as the economy grows and we see savings through uh, new Medicaid, we're able to pay for it. Okay, but you, do you, have you seen it in writing that the taxes actually do cover the cost? That the taxes yeah, cover the cost? Yeah, something from the federal government that actually says that. Yes. Okay. Has, um, my understanding is, is that Kathleen Sebelius has said that it's all or none for the state. We, we can't like, choose to go up to 100% or anything less mm -hmm. than the full 138%. Is that correct? That's my understanding. Yeah. <coughs> if, uh, if people above 100% are to be granted tax credits through the health insurance exchange. Why why not let the tax credits, you know, accrue to them and let them, you know, get on get their health insurance through that method rather than having the state be on the hook at some point. <coughs> well, I mean that I don't think we're we're just not in a situation where that's an option. Well the only reason is is that Kathleen Sebelia says so, right? Well, I, I don't know the, the actual rules of, of that department or not. I don't know if the secretary decides it or not for a congressional matter. I guess what I'm saying is that this is the system that we have, so let's try to capitalize it on best we can for the state of Missouri. Okay. Now, <laughs> under this program, people aged, blind, and disabled, they would still have to live at 85% of the poverty level in order to take advantage of this, wouldn't they? Mm -hmm. So where's the social justice in that? In, uh, it seems to me that the role of government should, if it's to take care of people who are, you know, needy, those who are most needy are those who are not able-bodied. So why would we want them to live at 85% of the federal poverty level, but yet let somebody get free health care essentially at 138.7%? Well, I, I think as this bill was developed, things like that happened. And I... I'm certainly not going to defend everything about the bill. I'm here to say, you know, the uh, the Affordable Health Care Act for Obamacare. I'm here to say that this is uh, passed by the Congress 
and we should we should use this ability. So some of those things are right, Senator, that this line fairness yeah. should this, be in there. This line in our budget was eight hundred and eighty million dollars for half a year uh, in House Bill what ten, I think. And uh, Ian McCaslin, the director of uh, Mo Health Net, said that under the structure that they have they're planning to implement if this should pass is that they would pay providers at the rate of 120 to 130 percent of Medicaid, Medicare. Okay. Right now, physicians who aren't primary care are getting like 63, 64 percent of Medicare. And uh, primary care is supposed to be getting 100 percent for the next two years, but it hadn't really started yet. So under this program, if you earn less than 19 percent of the segment that already has custodial parents, that already has it, then they'll be getting paid at the rate of 63% of Medicare. Mm -hmm. But if you earn one percentage higher or under this program, the providers and hospitals and so on would be getting paid 120 to 130% of Medicare, Medicare. Where's the logic in that? Well, I don't know if this, this helps the situation, but in, in uh, Senate Bill 3, 349, I have that uh, Try to read. Oh, um, reimbursement rate for providers shall be comparable to, comparable to commercial reimbursement payment levels. Right, exactly. Trend. Why is that? Why would we want to pay them so much more, given that for decades under the Medicaid program we've been paying them like you know 63 percent of Medicare, which is just barely enough to survive? You're asking me why we should pay doctors well, Why would more? we want to suddenly? I mean, that decision, those words, commercial reimbursement payment levels double the cost of the program to the state of Missouri, ultimately. Why? <coughs> well, I, I mean, I'm, it's interesting that we're having this conversation. I, I, guess, I guess I think that doctors should be reimbursed at a fair rate, and that provides more health care and more access to health care. Okay. I think that the doctor should, you know, there's, there's, it, it's a tough thing when a doctor doesn't get reimbursed um, at a regular rate because they're trying to help people in need. I think the commercial rate would be more fair for them. Then, then why don't we do it under the rest of the Medicaid program? The answer is we can't afford it. Um, I was interested in a comment that you made about if we don't do this, that it won't be a payment to our national debt. Yeah. Well, how does that figure? Because let's just say that it's $5 billion in the next three years. We don't enact this legislation. Won't the federal government not spend the five million? Five billion? Well, do you have maybe you have more faith in the federal government in the end that? I I think that this is. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a false choice to say that we're get, we okay. We don't want the money, so please apply it to the federal debt. Well, um, well where else does it go? I mean, to other other states. Well, but aren't those other states going to make independent decisions and whether they expand, they're going to get paid? And some regardless. will, and some won't. Yeah, I know, but and they'll, they'll, they'll the amount no of their payment deal. won't depend on whether we do it or not, will it? No, will it? I'm not, I'm not sure what you're asking. Well, no, mean? no. The total amount paid by the federal government for the Medicaid expansion is dependent upon each state's decision. Sure. Yes, okay. And Fall it is it. independent of our decision on what we're going to do, right? Yes. So if we don't spend the money, the money stays in the United States Treasury, correct? I, it come stays on. somewhere it and it doesn't come back to the people who are actually paying the taxes. Okay, well that may be it's true, because, but it does stay in the because, United States Federal Treasury. Well, in the way that, you know, we can say we don't want to participate in the program, but on April 15th we're all, we have to participate in the program because we pay taxes. That wasn't my question. But, you know, if, if, they, if we had some type of idea where we're not going to participate and you're going to give back a, 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 a refund to the people of Missouri, that's a different tour. Okay. I and understand that, that, but that's not my question. Anyway, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator, Senator Sifton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let's talk about a writing by the federal government uh, talking about whether this is going to save us money or not, the Affordable Care Act, that is. We, I mean, we have, and I think later today we're going to be taking up a fiscal note challenge uh, here uh, in the Missouri Senate, uh, uh, we have the Congressional Budget Office in Washington uh, that reviews legislation and scores it before it's passed. It did that in the case of the Affordable Care Act, did it not? Mm -hmm. and, when it's, and when the CBO scored the Affordable Care Act, it concluded that it would lower the deficit, right? Mm -hmm. 
and then we had the Roberts decision, and we also, incidentally, in the interim, had a change in control uh, in Congress uh, in 2010, and the uh, ACA was again rescored and again concluded to lower the deficit, perhaps somewhat less, in part because of the change uh, in whether states are going to be required to sort of or, or have a, a choice as to whether they opt in or opt out. But the CBO has now twice said the overall effect of the ACA is to lower the budget deficit. Isn't that right? Well, and, and, and to create this program, and to, you know, the, to help economic growth and, and to cover people. Thank you. Any further questions from the committee? Okay, here's how we're going to do it. We have to be out of here by 3.40, so I'm going to allot 45 minutes for pro, 45 minutes for con. I'd ask each witness to limit their testimony to three minutes. We're going to start out with those people testifying in favor. And keep in mind, we're, we're pretty familiar with the issue. So obviously you have testimony. I want to give everybody an opportunity to testify. That's why we have to limit it, otherwise we wouldn't get everybody in. Um, but if, you, you know, if you're a me too, just say you're a me too. Um, if, if somebody before you says something that covers dollar amounts or anything else and you agree with it, you can say I agree, but we don't need to, to go back over it. Also, everyone who testifies will need to fill out a witness statement uh, so that we have a record of that. And then, and then also, uh, we don't allow the reading of written testimony in this committee. So if you have written testimony, we'll take it and we will read it when we're not burning up the clock to get out of here at 340. But if you have something you want to say on top of your written testimony, it's, it always works better if you just look at us and tell us what you want to tell us, rather than sitting there reading. So, Senator. Thank you. Can I call my? Yeah, and, and since you have a much better idea, I'll let you call witnesses as you want to call them. And then if you run out and there's others, we'll just take these. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative St. Luke's Hospital. Thank you, Senator. Uh, as it's coming up, I have a couple submitted written that I guess I can submit to you. Yeah, if you want to just get that to us, we'll, and even if you don't have copies for everybody, Michelle, we'll make sure they get copied and they get to everybody. Thank you. Yep, feel free. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Tim Bams. I am the Senior Director of Public Affairs for St. Luke's Health System here to testify in support of Senate Bill 349. Good to see you, Tim. Um, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with our health system, we are Kansas City based. We operate 11 hospitals with approximately 9,600 employees. And um, I know that the committee is familiar with the issue, and I would be happy to make myself available here for any questions that you may have. Did you have any written testimony today? I do not. Okay. All right, and you're in favor? Yes, sir. Seeing no questions. Thank you, Tim. Senator, I apologize, but I was in the other room, and maybe this question's already been asked and has a sponsor. I just want to know if there was any kind of reform in this field that he's offering. Medicaid. Uh, I don't know if that's been asked. If not, I would like to. Why don't you go ahead and ask that question, and they'll just take a minute, and we'll go ahead and test it. You can ask the sponsor. Sure. Thank you. This, all this bill does is, is allows us to expand the Medicaid to participate in programs. So there's no no types of reform in this bill whatsoever to, right. to the system. That's right. And are you open to reform? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. The other thing you mentioned earlier in your testimony that you had a uh, somewhat of a sunset that was in this bill. I have I have a, a trigger, uh, for lack of better words, that uh, the clause is, it says that the federal government does not fall through with their commitment. We don't. We're not on the on the line. So the program would stop in Missouri. Mm -hmm. Is that what your bill does? Yes. <coughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. vote of anybody. Right. The federal government doesn't do their part of it. Then we, we're not on the line for the no for the entire action, is what I'm saying. Yes. It automatically just quits. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. We did have a hearing in the next room over that just quit, so we we'll have overflow, yeah. and it should be what's going on in here should be piped into there. If anybody doesn't want to stand here, they want to sit down. There'll be some overflow next door. Take All right. So good. Next witness. Okay, if you can say your name for the record. Yes, Daniel Landon, Missouri Hospital Association. Uh, Pay of time. taxes to the federal government. And we want to see as much of that money come back as possible. Um, over the course of, from between now and 2021, an estimated $15.7 billion would come back to Missouri if we pass Medicaid expansion. We would like to see that injected into the uh, state's economy. And then another reason why we're in support of this legislation is that 
we don't pass it, there's going to be a massive amount of cost shift from hospitals for uh, uncompensated care that will go from hospitals to employers mainly and uh, private insurers. That will be happy to answer any questions. Senator Rupert. Thank you. Um, so is this put up by a vote of the just take it to the board, somebody brought it up and they had a vote on the board of the Missouri Chamber of how you came to this? Yes, our executive committee and our healthcare policy committee uh, made a, a decision that we would be in support of this legislation and Medicaid expansion as a whole. And your executive committee is the one that has the vote on whether or not? Correct. They, and how, there's, how many hospitals and healthcare providers sit on the executive committee? I do not know that off the top of my head, but I can get that information to you. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, yes, Senators. My name is John O'Rear. I'm a resident of Jefferson City. I'm uh, sorry I'm not dressed in a suit. It's not any disregard to you all, but I'm a dad. And I'm a member of NOM. And I'm here to try to put a human face on the decision that you're going to make here. My son uh, was an exemplary student in Jefferson City High. He worked for the city of Jefferson as their courier. He had a very responsible job. When he graduated from college, he was awarded an academic scholarship worth over $50,000 to go to Central Methodist University like my other children did. His first year in college, things began to happen, his grades went down, and before the year was up, I was called to get him because his grades failed and his behavior became erratic. I brought my son home. We started down the rabbit hole of mental illness. And over the course of the next two years, because the Affordable Health Care Act was not passed yet. I did not have health insurance to take care of my son's needs. And for two years, I fought the system. I saw my son in jail. I saw my son in the emergency room. I saw my son in um, uh, inpatient care for mental health. After two years of struggle, two suicide attempts, a loss of his job, a breakup of my family, he was arrested on a minor charge. And my friends in the law enforcement community came to me and they said, you know what, Mr. O'Rear, we can get your house and your son treatment. All he has to do is plead guilty to a crime. So he pled guilty to a petty, a petty crime of less than $20. And he went into the health care system and, and the penal side. And thank God he got into treatment he needed. He was put into outpatient treatment for because now he has a dual diagnosis because like most young people, uh, they aren't treated. He self-medicated with drugs. He became an addict. So he had a dual diagnosis of addiction and mental illness. After two and a half years, I can tell you that he is doing well now. He got the treatment that he needed. But no young person should have to commit to a, a crime to get treatment in the richest nation in the world. I went with him, sir, and I sat in those NABs, Narcotics Anonymous. And when my son stood up and said, my name is Seth O'Rear, and I'm an addict. It was like being stabbed in the heart, I can tell you that. But that's what it took. I went with him that night after that meeting and met his sponsor. His sponsor said to me, does your son Seth have a good suit? And I said, yes, but what's that got to do with his addiction? He said, if he stays in the, in the NA program, he will have to have that suit because he will be burying his friends. And if he's not successful, we'll have to bury your son in that suit. Now, I'm in this room. I don't wear a suit. There are a lot of people in here who have suits. They have very important facts to make. But when you see these people in suits and you decide to vote on funding this, understand that Medicaid expansion will get my son and thousands of other people the, the, the treatment that they need and they deserve. And so when you look at the people in suits, think about my son. I never want him to have to wear his suit. I never want to have to wear a suit. And there's thousands of other people that don't want to wear suits when their children are buried and lose their life to drugs, to suicide, to all of these things that come about when they're not treated for Medicaid. Thank you very much for your testimony. Any questions of the witness? Senator Keogh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, John, I appreciate you coming forward. Ms. Anderson. I know you spent a lot of time mm -hmm. in your personal time uh, and passion to tell people about this issue and I just want to tell you that um, it's, it's uh, very courageous what you're doing to go out and talk about this so I appreciate it. Thank you. 
Thank you, Senator. I don't mean to be disrespectful and just passionate because I've been with my son to four funerals. I've seen his friends that have died of overdose and died of uh, suicide because they did not get the treatment that they need. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Shaw. Just, a, just a quick question, sir. Is your son disabled? No, my son was not disabled. My son was an exemplary student. His disability was his mental illness, and he could not get treatment under the system. He, the, the mental illness did not, was not a disabling one. Well, it was disabling to the fact that he couldn't continue to go to school. If you're familiar with bipolar disorder, sir, it is disabling until they get the treatment that they need. Thank yes. you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Schaefer. Mr. Chairman of the committee, my name is Keith Schaefer, and I've had the privilege of being in front of you in the past talking about this issue, and so I'm not going to repeat what I said before. I have full testimony that's in written, and it will be sent to you. We did a report, however. Uh, we uh, did an analysis the last uh, two or three weeks uh, that uh, we are beginning to talk about. It was finished uh, a few days ago, and I was not did not have the report when we talked to you last time, so I thought I would uh, would add that. That the eloquence of the last speaker tells you why we need to do this kind of thing. The uh, concern that I have is if we don't do this kind of thing, I believe that we are potentially headed for a cliff that worries me a lot. To understand what I'm going to tell you about this, we provided the report by the way to your office so you can have it. Uh, there, uh, we lost about 1,400 acute psychiatric beds in the state since 1990. We have left for adults, young adults, we have left about 1,174 beds across the state. And the vast majority of those beds are full, and they're full of people, as uh, the hospital we talked about earlier, who have a very high percentage of uncompensated care and need. They are charity care uh, hospitals. We looked at uh, charity care beds. We looked at four hospitals in the state. We tried to pick them geographically. We picked Co uh, Cox Health in Springfield, Truman Lakewood, where Charlie Shields is the CEO in uh, Independence, SSM St. Joe in St. Charles Winsville. Uh, we looked at Twin Rivers Regional and Kennett. And one of the things that we found uh, is that while they had, uh, they ranged from 646 beds to 116 beds, their psychiatric inpatient beds were very, very small, but an extremely high of all the, uh, a high percentage of all the charity care they did. For instance, at Cox Health in Springfield, uh, that 646 bed the hospital had 42 total psychiatric beds for adults, but 24% of all the charity care they did in that hospital was attributed to those 42 beds. Truman Lakewood has 310 beds and has 28 psychiatric beds, but 47% of all the days that were charity care in those hospitals were delivered at Truman. SSM has 331 beds, 61 acute care beds, of 58 percent of all the uncompensated care days that's delivered to the hospital is in those 61 beds. And finally, Blue Twin Rivers, which is 116 beds, has only 12 acute psychiatric beds. Of 52 percent of all of its uncompensated care happens in those 12 beds. So my concern, Senators, is that if we miss our guess about how hospitals can manage and handle the cost of uncompensated care when they lose 250 million, actually, I think, in the out year. And while that's a low percentage in the first year, I would alert you that if I'm Ken James or Charlie Shields or uh, Steve and, uh, and Cox, I will have to look at the actions that I take first to offset that. And I think the first action will be to close <coughs> adult acute care beds. And I think they'll not wait five years to do that. I think they'll do it early and try to offset future problems. That is a great concern to us, a great concern to county sheriffs all across the state, certainly a great concern to Naomi and the people who are, who are involved in the need for those things. Thank you, Director. And we have discussed this in the past, uh, so, <coughs> Senator Roof. Thank you. Is any of the money in the Medicaid system or in this bill or anything directed to those with developmental disabilities? Uh, yeah. we, we are not sure about that. We were very interested in that issue. Uh, technically, it might not be because uh, people with developmental disabilities are determined disabled before, usually before the age of 18 or at the point of the age of 18, and whereas an awful lot of this coverage is for 19 to 64-year-old individuals. 
it's possible because we're not serving all of the people who have the golden disabilities in the state. It's possible that families between um, uh, 85 percent and 138 percent might come forward. Alabama was working on this process. We are not able to document that. Thank you. Cancer Society. Members of the committee, Ms. Snodgrass with the American Cancer Society. I'll be real brief because many of the points have been made, but the key thing is to keep in mind that many cancer patients are currently in Medicaid, and this will increase the amount of cancer patients that will be able to receive treatment. And we know that comparing to being uninsured, patients that have Medicaid coverage have higher rates of survival because of affordable access to care, treatment, drugs, and hospital services. Medicaid enrollees also have increased access to early detection and preventative services. So we wholeheartedly support the Medicaid expansion. 10% of cancer patients are diagnosed, are uninsured. Um, additionally, this creates an access issue. If hospitals are closing or reducing the oncology um, services that they provide, this will have patients driving further and further. And if you know, when you have a cancer patient, um, it is very difficult to travel by yourself. Oftentimes, um, you have to have a caregiver who has to take off a day of work. So this in includes productivity issues for individuals who don't have um, cancer. So it's a coverage issue for cancer patients and it's an access issue. So we wholeheartedly support expansion. Any questions for the witness? Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Uh, Missouri Academy of Family Physicians. Thank you for uh, having me uh, speak. I'm Dr. Red Weisbart. I'm, uh, I'm here speaking on behalf of the Missouri Academy of Family Physicians. As you probably know, we represent 1,900 uh, family physicians across the state of Missouri in virtually every, every district. So I'm glad to have a chance to speak to them. My written testimony will have more to say, but on the three key issues I'd like to eliminate a bit. First of all, there's plenty of evidence that Medicaid saves lives. There's plenty of evidence that Medicaid saves lives. I've given you references on my written materials. Uh, the last time it was looked at in 2005, there were 774 uh, people in Missouri who died from not having insurance. So the stories that we're hearing are, are representative. Medicaid is flawed, but it is way better than having no insurance. I was heartened by your comment at the beginning that when you set this up, uh, we all actually agree we have to do something. It's more a question of is this the right tool? Uh, I would say yes, this is the right tool. The, the second piece is that I believe the evidence that suggests that we're losing the dish funds will compromise the ability to maintain our rural hospitals. And if indeed we lose 40 to 50 percent of them, that means that will affect wealthy and poor people alike. It's not just the Medicaid population, that's all of us. Anyone who lives in a district that loses their hospital is, is in serious trouble from that. Um, the question was raised, should we not fix Medicaid's problems first and then expand it? Um, I would submit to you that there are problems in all types of health care structure and payment. Today. And to delay fixing it, to delay expanding it uh, before we fix it is sort of like the uh, editorial that Heidi Miller put in uh, the post dispatch a few days ago, where she said that's like taking uh, people who are on a boat that has sunk and are waiting for, for the lifeboats to come and say, Good news, the lifeboat is coming, but first we have some business process improvement things to deal with. So I would submit to you that you can't do that in healthcare. Delays in healthcare jeopardize people's lives. Uh, we know in heart attacks, time is muscle, in strokes, time is brain cells. In delaying health care in this way, we, we are jeopardizing people's lives. So let's, let's not do that yet. Thank you very much. Questions for the witness? <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Krasnow? And members of the committee, I'm Mark Krasnoff. I'm a general internal medicine physician in St. Louis. I represent myself, and I hope I represent the other physicians in St. Louis. I represent some of the physicians in St. Louis today. Um, what I'm asking for you to do is take a different perspective about hope and a personal perspective, what we're trying to create and preserve. And that is something that's been lost in this country and needs to be recreated, and that is the doctor patient relationship. People who get their health care piecemeal through emergency rooms, miss visits where they can and when they are ill uh, do not get good health care. 
even if they go to a great institution. It is not the way to get patients taken care of. Uh, you probably all each have a physician and you know who your doctor is. And that's a vital part of getting care that is cost effective. It's worth every penny in answer to the question of why we you pay the primary care doctor enough that they'll willingly we'll, we'll see the patient like any other patient. Um, I had a patient I saw yesterday with the flu. Uh, she got treated for the flu. Her husband's not a patient of mine, but he was in the rating room. I brought him in and treated him with prophylaxis for the flu. But I just heard him and took care of him, so we didn't have to do anything else to prevent him getting sick and missing work. And he was unable to function for a while. And she went home and her sister called me. She's been exposed. She needed treatment. She'd been breastfeeding her babies. She's my patient as well. Her husband is my patient already. They both got treatment and prevention. Without this kind of cycle of care, knowing the patients, instead you get what I got overnight. With the doggone call as the primary physician for a follow-up from the emergency room for patients who come in who don't have a doctor. And I get a phone call or an email now, it's electronic, I get news that there's a patient who's going to need follow-up after a stay in the ER where they got blood drawn and they got their cat and this didn't happen last night, but they get blood drawn, but in some cases they get cat scans to allow pulmonary embolism when they basically had heartburn. It's absurd. You're going to get every penny back of your money in the short term and the long term. When a patient has kidney stones and goes into kidney failure, they're on the federal dole forever after that. Prevention. We pay for dialysis for everybody. Whether they could have gotten their kidney stones out if they had a doctor or not. This kind of thing happens in real life every day, all the time. I was sitting here, we're burning money in Missouri. And I'd love to take any questions. Any questions? Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, Providers Coalition. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Joe Purley. I'm the CEO of the Missouri Primary Care Association, but I am here today as chair of the Coalition for Healthy Economic Growth. And our coalition is the largest gathering of health care providers and health organizations in at least a decade focusing on this, on any one issue. And our focus is to work with you and find a mechanism to draw down these federal dollars that we pay in taxes to come back and bolster our economy and bolster our health care system and access to care for the underserved. And with that, uh, we want to work with you to develop a Missouri solution to improve access and with that I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions for the witness? Seeing none, thank you very much. Um, I have spoken to many of the members of the committee already about the budget piece of the Medicaid expansion and I just wanted to hit on a couple of the highlights since I've not gotten to talk to all of you. Uh, that the sheet in front of you summarizes really uh, the information that I've already walked many of you through. There is a net positive impact on the budget uh, due to Medicaid expansion. A uh, couple of reasons for that. One is the state share of the program for the first three years is zero. Uh, so we're basically funding it with 100% federal for the first three years. Even when we do get up to the full 10% share, there's still a net savings to general revenue uh, because mainly because of the fact that we can flip people. We are currently covering with either 100% general revenue, such as the Department of Mental Health, and I believe Dr. Schaefer talked to you that, about that, or other programs uh, to fully funding those uh, services through federal funds. So you can see with the table on the top of each one, the net savings to general revenue over each of the fiscal years, uh, all the way out until we're completely covering the 10% share, which is fiscal year 2021. The key assumptions I've walked many of you through before, I have them here for your reference, I'm not going to go over those. Uh, provider impact, wanted to reiterate that because we think it's important to ensure access to services with this program, we are proposing that we pay commercial rates to providers that is solely to increase access. We believe by increasing access, particularly to preventative care and doctor care, that we'll be able to reduce the overall cost of the program. We do have components built in for pay for performance. So as part of your reimbursement, 
you would need to do certain types of performance. Those are things that we would like to talk to the legislature about, particularly how we would do that. Um, and then uh, we also have a provider impact in the form of increased payments to providers. And I've outlined those increased federal payments in that top box on page two, ultimately the $2.3 billion in an increased uh, payments to providers. Directly below that, I believe many people who testified today testified about the reductions to the hospitals. These are numbers that have been provided by the Missouri Hospital Association. It is their estimate of the statewide reduction in hospital payments that will happen from three things. One is the Medicare cuts. Uh, Medicare program will reduce payments to hospitals. Uh, starting out at only 69.5 million, but quickly increasing up to 785 million uh, when those cuts are uh, in fiscal year 2021 by that time. The Medicaid dish cuts that are on this sheet, again, are just estimates. But the Hospital Association is estimating that ultimately our Missouri hospitals would lose roughly 272 million in Medicaid dish payments. That subtotal, just with those pieces that we knew about up until the last couple of weeks, ultimately is about a billion dollar reduction in hospital payments. As part of the sequestration deal that happened, and in order to avoid the cuts to the doctor payments, hospitals were further reduced in sequestration, the latest deal, uh, and that will cut another roughly uh, 94 million from hospitals. Uh, and you can see the net impact of all of those changes starting at $154 million and increasing ultimately to $1.1 billion. Uh, finally, on page three, something we've not talked as much about with this committee, but since the legislative proposal is in front of this committee, wanted to talk briefly about the reforms to the system. Uh, we have been making what improvements we can with the core program. We've been working with this uh, legislature as well as uh, in future years, recent years, as well as the last couple of years to lower the cost of our Medicaid program. Our average annual per member per month increase for the last four years has been 3.7% in the Medicaid program, which is fairly low uh, compared to other health care programs. It has been particularly low in a couple of categories. Parents only at a 1.7% average annual increase. Kids have been about 3%, the elderly 1.7. Where we have seen higher increases is on the side of people with disabilities as they use additional uh, services. But even with that, 5.6% for that category. Overall, less than a 4% increase on a per member per month. Can we do more? Absolutely. But we have made some good strides. What expansion allows us to do is to build on that. Because Medicaid expansion gives states increased flexibility that we do not have with our core program. And those types of flexibilities that we have would include, for example, providing health care coverage through an individual's employer. Uh, we can buy health care coverage through the Medicaid program to make sure that those individuals stay connected to their employer and that health insurance pr uh, program. We believe that's very valuable for people to stay connected to their employer and that health care. Uh, we can also incentivize uh, proper use of health care through copays. Uh, basically, we'll be able to charge copays on services that are less desirable and not charge them on services that are more desirable. So we have the flexibility to charge co-pays to really help influence the purchase of services uh, for our clients. We also will be able to do pay for performance. If we're doing a commercial rate, part of that commercial rate could be a pay for performance component. You really can't do that with the core program because our reimbursement rate is so low. And so we believe we have a lot of flexibility with the Medicaid expansion that we don't have with our core program. And if we can prove those types of reforms work, they actually improve access to, uh, to care, improve health care outcomes, and are more cost efficient, it would give us very good information that we could then use for our core program. With that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Linda. Senator Roop. Are any of the reforms that you just mentioned in this bill? Uh, they are not, but they don't need to be. They are uh, things that we intend to do, uh, whether or not there is specific legislation requiring it. Thank you. 
Anyone else? Senator Shaw. Historically, Medicaid has always paid cost. The statute says that it be based on cost, as mm -hmm. always. Um, the reimbursement for which providers, hospitals, physicians. It varies by provider group. Uh, for hospitals, for example, we do cost reports. Right. For nursing homes, we do cost reports. For FQHCs, we do cost reports. And then reports. over time, we decided that we could save money by putting people on managed care because it's capitated, and that, that we, instead of paying fee for service, put them on managed care and actually lower the aggregate cost. Isn't that correct? Um, managed care, yes. The, one of the components of managed care is reducing the overall cost of the program. So now if we're going to take these 300,000 people and pay commercial rates, that's going to be way more than it would be with just fee for service, wouldn't it? It actually, two things, Senator, if I may. Uh, the provider rates will be slightly higher overall. Uh, some more so than others. Doctors, obviously, we're lower on doctors than we are on other services. The other is through the commercial package, because of the care coordination piece, we believe the overall cost will be well within what Medicaid would normally pay. So I just want to point out to the committee that if you take the Medicaid spend and multiply it times about 40%, you get the hospital spend. The hospital spend on this line at $880 million for six months would be $704 million a year. Thank you, Senator. Any further questions? Thank you, Linda. Reverend Tager. Mr. Chairman, yes, sir. Senators, thank you. I'm Doyle Sager. I'm pastor of First Baptist Church here in Jefferson City, Missouri. I'm also a member of Missouri Faith Voices, an organization coalition of approximately 200 congregations across the state of Missouri. There were approximately 200 of us here yesterday visiting with legislators, and uh, about 50 to 60 of us met with uh, Governor Nixon to discuss these issues. I'm here obviously to speak in favor of the bill and to say that uh, we are here today not only to think about the dollars and cents, but to think about the faces of the people, the people who don't have lobbyists, the ones who are working today and can't get off work to come uh, speak to their important issues. We're here for the children, for the elderly, and we believe deeply that this is a moral issue, that the Hebrew prophets and Jesus himself uh, challenged us, invited us to care for the people who fall through the cracks to the people who are pushed to the margins of society. We, we remember that the motto of our state is the welfare of the people will be the supreme law. And we feel like this bill is an opportunity for us to be good <coughs> stewards of the money that is available. But even more importantly, this bill is an opportunity for us to be stewards of the health of Missourians. Uh, we believe that uh, we should be thinking about the welfare of all Missourians, not just some Missourians. This is a sacred trust from God. I have, with, I have with me uh, testimonies of several of the people who were here yesterday but could not stay today. They're from various parts of the state, and I will leave those with your staff. Thank you very much. We'll get that to the members of the committee. Any questions? Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I, there may be more in support. This is the, that's my list. Okay, okay, we've we got about 10 minutes left. I will mention that Cardinal Bergoglio, is that how you pronounce that, from Buenos Aires, is the new pope. I don't think anything. Right. Buenos Aires. Very interesting. Okay. Uh, anyone else who wishes to testify in favor of the bill? Yes, sir. My name is William Lee, and I'm here to represent the Catholic Foundation of Missouri and of Kansas. And we are in favor of this bill. Uh, I have written testimony. You each have a copy of that written testimony. Okay. We've got a big stack of written testimony. So I know you do. And it. there's one thing for sure. Uh, for, I think, uh, Senator Wood, you said, does the bill cover people who have developmental disabilities? Well, epilepsy is a developmental disability. And uh, people who have epilepsy 
Uh, they can be covered by this bill because a person who ends up suddenly getting epilepsy, because it can happen suddenly, because according to the national average, one in 26 people are going to suddenly be hit with a seizure. And those people will end up applying probably for SSDR, SSI. And once they do, they'll end up being over the limit. So they'll end up having to spend that. Well, if Medicaid expansion is put into effect, they're not going to be able to obtain Medicare for another two years. But they can get Medicaid through the Medicaid expansion. The Medicaid expansion will go ahead and eliminate spend down, allowing them to go out and work, earn money, pay taxes, both federal and state, getting <coughs> in the state revenue, and going ahead and participating in society. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. See no questions. Thank you. Uh, next person, that's my favorite bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Aaron Brower of Partnership for Children is my contractor to support us in the Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Raymond Carty, President of Associated Industries in Missouri, we have conditional support. So we would like for you to take this bill and use it as an opportunity to transform the Medicaid system. I've heard there are some opportunities that the administration has thought about. We'd encourage you to have additional ideas as well, things that can increase efficiency and eliminate administration services. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Cindy Keel, I'm Executive Director of NAMI Missouri. Senator Pierce, I'm sorry, one more jump back here. Sorry about that. Uh, Ray, I do know that uh, House Bill 700 has been proposed. And is that kind of your way of thinking as well, that that could be a vehicle as well for some reform? That's correct. There are several good things in, in House Bill 700 as well. We encourage you on this side to use this bill as a vehicle. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Try it again. I'm Cindy Steele. I'm Executive Director of the Missouri. And uh, on behalf of our 3,000 members and 1,000 more that we serve, we want to stand in support of this bill. Thank you very much. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you. Next person in favor. Um, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I'm Sarah Gentry here on behalf of the National MS Society. I want to go on record and support us and vote for Thank you very much. Next one. Mr. Chairman, Senators, uh, my name is James Shortle. I believe you have my one page testimony. Suffice to say, I live with a mental illness called bipolar disorder. Very serious. I'm here speaking on behalf of one in 17 Missourians who suffer from a severe mental illness and will be helped greatly by the passage of this bill. Thanks. Thank you very much for your testimony. Next one. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Strong, Director of Government Affairs for the Missouri Healthcare Association, we want to bow record and support the bill. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Kenny Jackson from the Missouri State Medical Association, would like to go on record and support this bill. Thank you very much. Susan Cook with the Missouri Association for Social Welfare. I presented you the Thank you very much. Next one, please. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Kaina Iman. As a registered lobbyist for Missouri Nurses Association, we would like to go on support. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman.